The preseason one review episode of the Bears Talk Underground is brought to you by our friends at SeatGeek. Let SeatGeek take the confusion out of your ticket buying experience. Instead of shopping dozens of sites to find the best deal, let SeatGeek do the dirty work for you. Their app scans the web for the best deals to your favorite game, concert, or show and rates them on a scale of 0 to 10 to let you know if you're getting the best bang for your buck. Use promo code ACAA at checkout to receive $20 off your first purchase. That's promo code ACAA for $20 off your first purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. The preseason uh, one review, week one review episode is brought to you by MyBookie as well. Guys, it's a new season, and with all the things that have changed in the NFL landscape, one thing hasn't changed. Where I'm putting my money down on all the games. My bookie has better bonuses and more prop bets than any other sports book, period. And this year, they're hosting the first online handicapping super contest. First place is guaranteed to win at least $100,000, and it only costs $100 to enter. All you got to do is pick five NFL games against the spread every week to climb the leaderboard and score your share of a huge cash prize. MyBookie also has live in-game betting on every NFL game. They've got the most rewarding player perks in the business, and for you fantasy guys out there, you can even bet over-under on how many fantasy points a player will score in each game. Join now and get a 10% deposit bonus. Use promo code BEARS100 to activate the offer. Visit MyBookie online today. That's M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E. And don't forget to use the promo code BEARS100 when creating your account to claim the bonus. At my bookie, you play, you win, you get paid. No guests today, guys. I know I'm breaking the string. It's been a long time since I've done a show just me, so I guess you'll just have to suffer through me uh, talking about it. I mean, I, I get used to it. That's going to be half the episodes that are happening from from now on. But uh, the Bears played a game on Thursday night. How exciting is that? I mean, yeah, we played football. It The, the official the season – or the preseason, the off season. What am I saying? The off season is officially in our rearview mirror, guys. The season has officially started. It's the preseason week one review episode of the Bears Talk Underground. So let's get to it. Holy bananas, Batman! Our beloved Chicago Bears played football. On Thursday, ending a streak of seven months and two days without our beloved taking the field. What's going on, everybody? Larry D. back, the preseason week one review episode of the Bears Talk Underground. And uh, it's good to finally be talking about something that actually happened instead of spending the last seven months and two days talking about what we'd like to happen, what we hope happens, what we think may happen. Now we can talk about what did actually happen. Our beloved took the field. Thursday night against the Carolina Panthers at Soldier Field. Um, there was a bit of excitement at the beginning of the game, or, or leading up to it, I should say, uh, when I had a notification pop up on my phone saying that Mitchell Trubisky was going to start the game on Thursday. It's like, Jesus, I didn't expect to see Matt, Mitch doing anything but wearing an earpiece with a hat and a T-shirt on the sidelines for Thursday night. I did not expect to see him in uniform at all, let alone taking the freaking field. And um, but nonetheless, fireworks were unnecessary. Uh, the Panthers started with the football and they gave the ball back to the Bears inside their own five yard line. So the Mitch Trubisky drive, the one and only drive of the game was three handoffs to Mike Davis and then a punt. And then we didn't see him again. So it was kind of all the excitement for no reason. Mitch didn't get to throw the ball to anybody. So nobody caught the first Trubisky toss of 2019 uh, or anything. Maybe we'll see it on Friday when the Bears play the Giants. But uh, thus far, uh, Mitch is zero for zero with pass attempts uh, in the preseason. So it's like that was those were the big fireworks going into it because you just didn't expect to see Mitch uh, on the field other than, like I said, on the sidelines in a T-shirt and, and, and a sideline hat with an earpiece so he can hear the plays and kind of coaching uh, the backups uh, through the uh, through the football game. I didn't didn't expect to see it at all. So when I was I was on the road driving home from uh, work and I saw that notification pop up that Trubisky's going to play tonight, I was like, oh, oh, man. So Trubisky's going to play a series or two. That's awesome. I didn't expect to see Mitch at all based on last year's preseason. He, I think he played maybe – 20 snaps all of last preseason including zero in the big dress rehearsal game against the uh the Chiefs uh and everything so yeah it was kind of crazy but um anyway 
Before we dive into the game, got a few things, news and notes I want to cover first. Uh, today was the Bears' last public practice uh, in Bourbonnet. They're going to uh, be officially closing up uh, camp now and moving things to the uh, to Hallis Hall in Lake Forest uh, starting on, uh, I think, Tuesday, they said. The Bears have one more uh, closed practice tomorrow uh, on Sunday. They have a day off on Monday, and they resume Tuesday morning uh, regular practices uh, to get ready for their matchup with the Giants uh, next Friday night. And I think they said it was just over 9,000 people showed up today to uh, to Bourbonnet for the last open uh, practice uh, of the year. So the Bears, as far as the fans are concerned, have officially closed camp and they are headed back to uh, to Hallis Hall to uh, conduct business from there for the remainder of the preseason uh, and such. So uh, it, it, I think that the preseason or the uh, training camp can be viewed as a success. Everyone liking what they're seeing from the team, especially uh, from the defense. Uh, they said Trubisky had an especially good day today as, uh, against the defense and, and making some throws. And one of the things that, that I've been hearing a lot, and it, it speaks a lot to uh, why it is we need to relax on the quote-unquote struggles that Mitch has had in training camp so far uh, this year. I've been listening to a lot of uh, p- uh, podcasts um, and interviews from Matt Nagy. Uh, the Hogan Johns uh, podcast had Ryan Pace on uh, earlier this week. A lot of good information there. And the thing that came out was that um, it's kind of revealed that you know people have been getting on Trubisky for the throws that he's been making in practice and, and uh, the, the throws that have been getting picked off and everything. Uh, apparently what we what uh, what they don't know or what they don't understand or or what have you is that I've heard Nagy say it I've heard Pace say it I even heard Dave Ragone the quarterback coach say they've been telling Mitch to force throws on purpose basically this is the place to make mistakes so go ahead and see if you can thread the needle between Mukamura and Eddie Jackson on that throw down the the sideline. See if you can make that throw. Go ahead and give it a try. Throw it in a double coverage. Throw it in the triple coverage because obviously in a game situation, you wouldn't do that. Here's the place to try that stuff. You don't want to experiment when you're between the lines and everything counts. You want to do it here in this situation here where it's just like, okay, let's run it back and try it again. Uh, only this time, don't make that throw or, or whatnot. They, they, they want Trubisky to test himself. And that's what they've been doing in practice. Sometimes it works great. I saw a dime of a throw uh, that he made today uh, in practicing a lot of clips. That's the other thing I love about social media is that I don't have to go to practice to be able to see some of the best things that happened there. Because a lot of people that I follow either are filming this stuff themselves or retweeting other uh, fans' videos uh, of the things uh, uh, happening uh, in practice. So. Um, you know, he made a dime of a throw today on the side, like over, over the, like over the cornerback and right in front of the safety, just perfect, right on the sideline before the receiver went out. A dime of a throw there. He made a really great throw to Adam Shaheen for a touchdown, who did not break every rib in his body when he made a one-handed diving catch and, and went to the ground in the end zone. So it was a touchdown in that particular throw. Adam Shaheen, he's okay. He got up, no concussion, didn't shatter any ribs when he crashed to the ground. So. Thumbs up to to Adam. He survived. He did not play on Thursday night, by the way. He was dressed but did not play, which was a surprise. But, um, you know, that was the thing that I found most interesting is, like, everyone's kind of harping on the mistakes that that Mitch has been making in practice, the interceptions that he's thrown, and now we know. His coaches have been telling him to do that. And they're not telling him to throw interceptions, but they're telling him to test the waters. You got the, one of the best secondaries in football out there, if you think you can make the throw, go ahead and try. Obviously, he's not going to be doing this in game situations, but here, test that, test it. See if you can make that throw. Throw it in a double coverage. See if you can get it, put it in a spot where your receiver can win and, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, number one, he's going against the best defense the NFL has to offer. And number two, his coaches are challenging him to test himself and practice. And that's what he's been doing. So that kind of took the, the shine off the negativity uh, for me, you know, I was kind of growing concerned with the, you know, the interceptions and people complaining about how he's looking and and how the defense is making him look. And now we know it's his coaches that have been pushing him to test those waters. Go ahead and try to make that throw uh, and all the rest of that stuff. So it kind of it, it 
it takes the edge off of of the negativity uh for me they're they're testing him they're telling him to make those throws to you know this is the decision that we want you to make here go ahead and challenge yourself see if you can make a a throw into triple coverage obviously that would not be advised in a regular game but so that's the thing with with uh mitch so i guess we all need to maybe calm down a little bit as far as uh that goes and um you know i think all of the hallis hall practices are closed to the public anyway they might be open to press uh and such but there will be no more no fans hanging out at uh lake forest so uh it's gonna gonna go off the off a cliff as far as the information we're getting from practice uh going forward but um yeah so i think it's been a good camp everybody's excited about the defense everybody's 50 50 on, on mitch and uh you know i think now that we have the full story on what actually been going on there then you know to probably give him more of the benefit of the doubt uh going forward and hopefully he will play a series or two on friday against the giants and get a chance to throw some passes see how he looks uh in live action so we'll uh we'll see there uh let's see what else do we have <sighs> you know this isn't really well one bit of drama before i get to this at the end to close out the segment um anthony miller went down with a leg injury uh today uh, I was just checking my social media before I got started. No word on the severity of the injury. Matt Nagy didn't have any answers uh, when he was talking to the press after practice. He basically went up, came down awkwardly, and was grabbing his lower leg. I'm hoping to God he just sprained his ankle. He's only going to be out, you know. You know, maybe he'll miss the preseason with the ankle injury or something like that. And hopefully he didn't tear any ligaments. It's just a sprain. Just put some tape on it, rub some dirt on, dirt on it, and get out there. Uh, kind of thing because Anthony Miller's can be huge for us uh, this year so I really believe that his growth will be equal to what we're going to see out of Mitch and everybody else on the offense uh, this year so scary headline to see oh Anthony Miller got hurt today and then hopefully you know no one's talking about a knee everyone's saying lower leg so hopefully it's just like an ankle sprain or something like that and it's no big deal but I'll be kind of holding my breath in the Anthony Miller situation until we hear what's actually going on with him so last thing I wanted to talk about, and this is not Bears related, uh, and it's not me as a Bear fan kind of rubbing it in uh, with the Raiders. It's just me as a football fan th that I just can't help shaking my head when I'm listening to this whole Antonio Brown situation going on out there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's one thing with the uh, for those of you who don't know, he's been in and out of practice in training camp because he did a cryotherapy treatment now this is a like a, a tube that you stand in it's like something like 300 below zero and it's you know for to help decrease inflammation you know it's done after workouts and things like that to help with uh, recovery uh, and everything well because the temperature is what it is your body can only handle it you can only be in there for like two to three minutes uh, tops and the reason that I know as much as I do know which isn't much is uh, I listen to the Joe Rogan podcast he swears by cryotherapy. He does it all the time. Uh, he says it's great for recovery, reduces inflammation, so on and so forth. Uh, Antonio Brown did not wear the proper footwear or any, I believe, when he did his treatment, and he got frostbite on his feet. And that's the, the quote-unquote injury that's been harping him uh, in training camp, why he hasn't been participating and, and things like that. However... The, the most recent drama with Antonio Brown is the fact that he is refusing to play, or at least that's the report coming out. It, it, I don't know if, if he's just steadfast. and It depends on who you want to listen to uh, on this. But right now, he's not at practice. He's not in camp. He's gone, gone dark, is what, the, what the, uh, the reports say. The Raiders say it's not true. He hasn't gone dark. But he's not at practice. That's the that's the main point, because he's been wearing the same helmet his entire nine year career uh, with the Steelers. He wants to use this helmet going forward in his time with the Raiders. Only the NFL after 2018 deemed those helmets unsafe and they're illegal. Uh, basically, they can no longer be used training uh you know um what equipment managers i should say across the league are you know are not allowed to give out those helmets in fact they're supposed to confiscate those style helmet and basically what it is it's like the, they're not the helmets that have any of those 
those odd little shape. You know how this, how basically the, the helmet is not round anymore. The helmet is round ish, but it's kind of got these little square thing. And those are like for impact. They're for safety. And Antonio Brown, from what I read, believes that these helmets protrude out a little bit further, which makes it harder for him to see. Or at least that's the argument that's being made uh, on his behalf or, or, or whatever the, the sticking point for him is. Regardless, the helmet that he has is just one of those smooth, round helmets and you know, probably has the old school face mask on it, you know, very simple and, and things like that. That helmet has been deemed unsafe, therefore illegal, and he can't use it. And it, at one point, he relented. He wore the new helmet only to come out the next day with his old Steelers helmet painted in Raiders colors only to be told, dude, you can't wear that helmet and get rid of it kind of thing. And he's basically refusing to play unless he can use his old helmet or at least that's what we keep hearing. That basically he's threatening to retire if he can't wear his old helmet that has been deemed unsafe and illegal uh, by the league. I mean, even guys like I think some of the last holdouts for the one for those old helmets, guys like Aaron Rodgers, guys like Tom Brady, they're already wearing the new helmets in practice and training camp and such right now. They're abiding by the rules because it's just a helmet. But uh, yeah, so he's he, he's uh, <laughs> he's holding out. I mean, talk about two off the wall things to just to not be in camp for. You you damn near freeze your feet off in a cryotherapy treatment, and even when that's kind of getting better or or whatever, now you won't play because you can't wear a helmet that the league has de- for your benefit for your safety. The de- the the NFL has deemed your old helmet unsafe. It's unsafe, man. It's the the chances, and this is a guy who's had concussion issues in the NFL uh, as well. Could be w- the reason why he's half nuts in the in the first place. He's taking too many shots to the head. It's like, well, we're trying to put a safer helmet on your head so that maybe you can extend and play a little bit uh, longer, especially at this point in your career. You're on a brand new team. You just signed a new contract. It's got $30 million in guaranteed money on it. You're going to walk away from that because you want to wear something that's not safe anymore? So I asked uh, our new friend, I asked your boy Q, who was on the show uh, at the beginning of our uh, opponent preview uh, process to uh, talk about the the Raiders and such and I asked him he's like dude are you just pulling your hair out over this and right now it's kind of a nonchalant thing uh, with Q he's not necessarily worried about it I mean it's still really early uh, in the preseason that might be playing something into it he's like I don't think this is going to be much this is going to be much ado about nothing uh, in the end he's not going to walk away from 30 million uh, guaranteed and what I my response to him was like well I hope that that's the half of his bipolar personality that's at the wheel when it comes time to make uh, that decision because Antonio Brown is uh, he's not all right man he's he's a weird dude I mean this is the guy that back in 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 March I think before he got traded to Oakland he in the interview he didn't necessarily say crazy things during the interview but he did the interview with a blonde mustache and that was it i mean he he didn't he didn't cut his hair or shave his head anything like that and nothing else was dyed he just dyed his mustache blonde it was striking it looked really weird especially on him so i don't know this is an odd guy he's a bit of a diva as we know the guy drama follows him everywhere which is the part that's got bear fans laughing because gruden didn't want to pay a 27 year old superstar at the height of his powers right now and then shipped him off for a draft haul that made that gave him the money that possible to sign and trade for an Antonio Brown the picks that he got from Chicago I believe one of the picks was the third rounder that that went to the the Raiders because they got him for a third and a fifth or something like that and the money that he could have spent on Khalil Mack he spent on uh, Antonio Brown among other guys but he traded one of the humble guys that did nothing but elevate our defense and our culture in Chicago when he arrived for a guy that's done nothing but put a black eye uh, on, on a Raiders organization that's trying to, to dig itself out from under all of this losing that it's been experiencing since their last trip to the playoffs and, or excuse me, since 2002. I mean, they've been to the playoffs in 
2016, which is looking like an aberration as opposed to the beginning to something great. So this is going to be a big year for the Raiders, and this drama is not helping it. This is the kind of stuff that can divide a locker room and be a big distraction uh, and all that. And, and I'm kind of my heart kind of going out to the Raiders because if you remember when I talked to Q, I'm excited about where the Raiders are headed because it means – that you know, a team that has has such uh, an, a rich history, championships, the Raider mystique. It used to mean something, and now all the Raiders. When you see the Raiders on your schedule, you're like, oh, there's a W right there. Doesn't even matter who's on the team. We're gonna kick their ass and we're gonna win because they're the Raiders and they suck. And I'm kind of hoping they can get that turned around. Well, well, not Week Five in London, but you get what I'm saying. It's it just uh, it's just something I kind of wish was changing. And this Antonio Brown thing is not going to uh, not gonna help. So. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that my two cents uh, out there. So let's go ahead and, and get finished with our, our review. Week one, Bears, Panthers from Thursday night. Was so excited about Thursday night. I, I went out and ordered a bunch of wings and, uh, you know, came home and got the food ready and sat down in front of the TV, chomping down on some wings from Wingstop and, and, and started watching uh, the game. I almost wept at kickoff because it was finally over. The long wait, seven months, two days, finally in the rear view. And we're playing football now. And uh, it's all downhill from here as far as, far as finally getting to the games when the game kicked off on thursday night august the 8th we were less than 30 days away from the bears kicking off we were four weeks away four weeks from the day to the bears and packers on thursday night to kick off the season which is the day that we've all been looking forward to since the nfl calendar uh was released back in back in april so and that was four very long months ago, and here we are. We're, we're getting closer to those dates becoming uh, a reality. And, um, you know, you, I heard, yeah, I mentioned before about how uh, Mitch, we got that notification on my way home from work about how Mitch was going to play, and I got a little excited about that. I was like, I wonder how many snaps he's going to get and, uh, and all the rest of that. And in post game, Nagy didn't really explain what the reason was for Mitch going out there for that one drive and, and doing the three handoffs, I think the handoffs is more of a strategic thing because they were backed up. You didn't want to get them sacked, get them hurt, that kind of thing. So that made sense. But why do that? Why start him? Why put him out there if all you were going to do is just have him hand off the ball every single time, John Fox? But um, at least he didn't put him back in at the end of the game to get him killed uh, or anything like that like Fox did. What? Jesus Christ, that guy. Um, but anyway... Chase Daniel came out after that. Um, David Montgomery played uh, after that. And basically a star was born uh, in Chicago on, on Thursday in the, in the mold of David Montgomery, who was a highly anticipated player. Everyone was dying to see him out there because this is the guy that we decided to go out and get as opposed to keeping uh, Jordan Howard, who had been a pretty good running back, a solid running back. I don't have anything bad to say. Uh, about Jordan Howard however everything that we saw from David Montgomery on Thursday night is a lot of stuff that we were we were we never saw Jordan Howard do I mean he caught the ball out of the backfield he was super dangerous in the open field and then more specifically on his touchdown run at the in the in the second quarter there that was a, a play that was designed to go up the middle and unfortunately, the Panthers were better than the offensive line on that play and beat our offensive linemen to the point of attack. Basically, they were standing exactly where uh, David Montgomery wanted or where the play was designed to go. They caved that down and gave him no place to go. If that was Jordan Howard, I see Jordan Howard lowering his head and trying to run through and kind of push his way into the end zone. Instead, David Montgomery made a couple of really nice moves. He stopped. He cut out to the outside and, and burrowed his way into the end zone from there. That's a run I don't think we see Jordan Howard make that, or at least not with the shiftiness and elusiveness that David Montgomery displayed on that one uh, particular play. What's funny about uh, the David Montgomery uh, experience on Thursday was that there wasn't as much of it as you think there was. Uh, he only played 13 snaps 
on Thursday night. It felt like a lot more, I guess because he made the most uh, of every snap that he took. He only carried the ball three times for 16 yards. He caught three passes for 30 yards, one of which was a 23-yard reception off of a screen play where Ted Larson made a huge, awesome block uh, on a on a defender. I think it may have been a linebacker or a safety, one of the two uh, coming up. Ted Larson went out there and got his guy and sprung uh, David Montgomery for a few extra yards, a 23-yard reception on that play, and I think the touchdown was from like five or six yards out. So he so six plays for 43 yards of offense, but it, it's kind of like uh, you know like one of those classic games where there were 60,000 people in the stadium, but 160,000 people claimed to be there it was you know six touches for 43 yards but you know it felt like he touched the ball 30 times for 150 that's that's how well he played in the short time that he was uh, on the field and this kid is a football player man I mean the the thing that my heart skipped a beat I don't remember when it was I don't know if it was still in the first half or sometime in the third David Montgomery was on the punt team for some reason because he made a tackle uh, one of the punt returner or the punt returner for Carolina made a really great return, got it all the way down to like the Chicago ten yard line or something, and it was David Montgomery that made the tackle that either brought him down or forced him out of bounds. One or one of the two, and it's the preseason. I'm not getting worried. I don't care. It's like, oh, look at this nice play by this kid, and so on. And so, is that David Montgomery? You know, it's like, what the hell's he doing out there? It's like, what are we nuts? This guy's supposed to be the future of our backfield and he's we got him out there making tackles on special teams that's crazy and then i was listening to the hogan johns podcast uh, about the game and they asked him it's like you know what were you doing and he's like i was i was just doing my job it's like he put him out there on punt team so i got to make a tackle so i went out and made a tackle it's like well there's all you need to know about david montgomery the guy just wants to go and get the job done so god bless him but please matt Nagy. Uh, t- Chris Tabor, our special teams coordinator, don't put him out there. Please don't do that. <laughs> I don't care how much you like Mike Davis and Tariq Cohen. Don't put David Montgomery on the punt team and have this guy making tackles. We don't need that. Please don't do that. You know, let Taquan Mazzell do that. Let That's going to be his gateway to making the team anyway because we took him out of the backfield, put him in the wide receiving core, which gave him almost no shot to make the team. But special teams, if he's going to do it, special teams is where it's going to happen. So send Taquan out there. Let him do that stuff. Don't have the future of our running back, uh, our backfield, making tackles on the punt team. I don't, I don't want to see that. God bless uh, David Montgomery for, for, for making the effort and, and making the tackle, preventing the touchdown, doing his job, uh, as he said. That's a football player right there. But for the love of Christ, keep him off of special teams, especially in the preseason, man. We don't want to see that. So I would hate to, to lose David Montgomery for the season because he dislocated a shoulder making a tackle on kick return or something like that. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that at all. So anyway, that was David Montgomery doing his thing. Uh, a few other players that flashed on, on Thursday night, uh, Ian Bunting, uh, the tight end that uh, has been talked about quite a bit. Um, he's outshined Dax Raymond, who was kind of like the sexy undrafted free agent uh, when the bears uh, made their 20 plus signings to their undrafted pool and uh ian bunting was kind of an afterthought this is a guy that's been getting reps with the ones in in training camp uh and such he um he had a couple of catches one of which he got peanut punched i mean the guy he had the ball in there pretty good the guy just perfect 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 peanut punch punched it right out thankfully the bears recovered so it was no harm no foul uh kind of thing but uh, redeemed himself very well uh, later on in the uh, in the quarter. I think this happened in the second quarter. Chase Daniel found him for a 45-yard reception down the middle of the field that set up the field goal, uh, set up a field goal from Elliott Fry, which, which A, he made the field goal, which thumbs up for that, but B, it was from 43 yards, which, of course, was the magical distance that Cody Parkey missed on in the playoff game against the Eagles. The only thing that would have been that would have made it more perfect was if it was on the right hash, like the field goal attempt against Philly was. But I think it was either on the left hash or dead center of the field. It wasn't on the right hash, I know that. But uh, he put it through. The crowd went bananas over the field goal and the fact that he made it and everything. 
Uh, it was kind of like a comedy watching the kickers kick because the crowd would just go crazy, kind of like they did with Parky after that, that crappy day uh, against the Lions only to come out the following Sunday and hit all his field goals uh, against the uh, Viking, which I said he would do, by the way. I called that 100%, but, you know, what do I know? But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, Ian Bunting, he did really well. Speaking of the kickers, if you were looking for a leader in the clubhouse after week one, it's definitely Elliot Fry. He uh, he hit all of his uh, attempts, and Eddie Pinero made a short field goal from about 23, 24 yards out later in the game, missed a 48-yard field goal, hooked it left, and, um, you know, it, it wasn't a pretty attempt. So hopefully he'll get more chances because um, it's kind of like if you could combine these two guys, you would have the perfect kicker because apparently Pinero is the guy, he's got the leg, but Fry is the accurate guy. So he's got a wall, apparently, that he's going to fall short of. I mean, even though he's hitting 60 yarders in practice, that's not the same as kicking 60 yarders in Soldier Field with the swirling wind and the loud and the deafening crowd and the best defense, uh, you know, the best uh, special team blockers or whatever uh, trying to kill the ball and coming at 100%, coming 100% full speed as opposed to whatever speed they're going at in practice and. Uh, and things like that. So it's it's great to show you can kick a 60-yarder, but doing it in a game, I don't know if they think he can do that. It sounds like if you gave, if you could put Eddie Pinheiro and Elliot Fry in a blender and you'd have a big leg kicker with great accuracy, then we've got our perfect guy. But it's going to be, you know, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other, based on what I've been hearing uh, about these kickers. But if the kicker uh, for week one for us against Green Bay is on the roster, the leader in the in the clubhouse right now was Elliot Fry after the night he had uh, against the uh, Panthers, and um, I think that the kickers did not kick at all today on Saturday, so uh, no public display of field goal attempts from Pinheiro and Fry going into the uh, on the, in the last public workout uh, or anything like that. So that was the kicking competition. Uh, who else did anybody play poorly? Yes, uh, Rashad Coward. Did not have a good night against the Panthers. Got called for a holding penalty. Uh, was was letting guys get inside of him and things like that. Not a really great uh, showing uh, for him. Uh, you know, I wish I could have watched the. It was on again this morning, but I, I missed the game on NFL Network. They replayed it. I didn't get a chance to watch it. Uh, I wanted to watch it to to focus more on on Rashad Coward, but I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, speaking of offensive line, Alex Bars. One of our undrafted free agents had a really good night uh, blocking. Number 64, pay attention to that number uh, going forward. I, I saw really good things uh, out of him. Uh, James Daniels did not play much, but he, you know, in his center position, made a really great block on one of the three Mike Davis runs that been a big, huge hole up the middle, uh, almost got a first down uh, on, the, uh, on the play, and it was Daniels that kind of made the block that opened the, the, the gate for Davis to go untouched was, you know, deep in the in the secondary before he got tackled uh, on the play. So uh, James Daniels seems to be adjusting well to his new position as the starting center uh, for the Bears. Um, I thought John Franklin the third played particularly well uh, on on Thursday night. Um, am I missing anyone? I'm sure I am. I'm I'm sure that there were more guys that played well. Uh, on Thursday that I'm not thinking of one person who also stuck out to me on Thursday night not in a good way was Tyler Bray oh well speaking with Chase Daniel 11 11 of 13 for 120 yards including that nice beautiful touch on the pass to Ian Bunting uh, to set up that field goal just before halftime and um, but Tyler Bray I think I said this about him last year as well this guy has got a cannon for an arm it's obvious this guy could throw it from one side of the earth to the other if he really wanted to if you don't necessarily care a lot about where it's going because his accuracy i it's garbage <laughs> he's not a very accurate thrower uh as well he had dax raymond for a touchdown but threw it behind him so it got deflected and knocked away uh that kind of thing it's like tyler bray could probably throw a football through a steel wall uh, if you asked him to, if, but if you told him where to throw it on that steel wall, he'd miss every single time. So it's uh, it's not a he's uh, he's destined for the practice squad 
once again, I don't think the Bears are going to carry three quarterbacks on their 53-man uh, roster. So I, I do believe that Tyler Bray's days in, in Chicago, or at least his days on the active roster, are are numbered. For, for this football team, especially, roster spots are at a premium. We're not going to waste one on a third-string uh, quarterback. He's going to have to spend time on the practice squad if he's going to play. Same as he did last year. The Bears only carried two uh, quarterbacks until Trubisky went down against Minnesota. Then we elevated Tyler Bray to the active roster so that he could back up Chase Daniel. And he, he ended up staying on the roster for the rest of the season. So, But like I said, wasn't happy with the shot. Coward. Cali Fitz also did not have a good day. Um, you, you figured that uh, when you get him out there against some of the second and third teamers, uh, this is a guy that, you know, week 17 last year against Minnesota, Kylie Fitz, Isaiah Irving were, were crushing the edges uh, against the Vikings. It was kind of like the big dagger at the end of the game for the Vikings was that, you know, the Matt Nagy's called off the dogs. He's put Aaron Lynch and, and Leonard Floyd and, and, and Khalil Mack back in their cages, and then he put Isaiah Irving and Kylie Fitz in there to kind of, you know, ease their way through the last five minutes of this game, and they're out there dominating like it's, Lawrence Taylor on one end and Reggie White on the other, man. It was just, you know, they went out there and ran through the the Vikings, and we saw none of that from Kylie Fitz in the uh, in the preseason game against the uh, Panthers. This was a guy that didn't made zero impact in that game. Got beat, uh, I think, once or twice in coverage. Just did not play well uh, at all uh, on, on Thursday night. Um, the starters that did play uh, were kind of surprising. Roquan Smith. Uh, started had a really nice looking sack on that first drive eddie goldman was out there gobbling up uh offensive lineman uh Bilal nichols god that kid is a stud i love him and um let's see anybody else in the second i think haha ha, clinton Dix played but that was probably more because he hasn't practiced much uh because he started on the pup list but he started uh on on thursday night uh as well so but uh I think that's all I got, man. The The Bears did not win the football game. They lost 23-13 to to the Panthers, but it's the preseason, so whatever. You know, wins and losses, uh, you know, horseshoes and hand grenades. Who cares? But uh, Friday night, they get a chance to they travel up to the Meadowlands to play the Giants at MetLife Stadium, and uh, maybe we'll see Mitch actually throw a pass or two uh, against the Giants on Friday night. Uh, we'll get to see Daniel Jones up close. Um, I did get to see Daniel Jones play. Uh, I didn't see Eli play on Thursday. He, much like Mitch, came out for one drive, was three and out, and then was done uh, for the evening. Daniel Jones comes out on the on the next uh, drive, was five for five for like 70 yards and threw a dime of a touchdown pass in the back of the end zone uh, to close out the first drive with a touchdown. And you're just like, uh-oh. <laughs> And maybe Giants fans, you know, nobody was happy. I, I, I don't think it was kind of like with the Bears. Like, I don't think anyone minded that the Bears picked Trubisky, but we traded up from three to two to get him. We couldn't get him at three, and that's what a lot of Giants fans was like, okay, well, people were, kept telling us we we're going to pick Daniel Jones, but at 17, not at number six. Why, why are we doing that when there's this pass rusher available or that DB and all that kind of stuff? Instead, we went out and got the quarterback, and, like, nobody was happy about that not so much that they were picking daniel jones but it's like who they weren't picking to take daniel jones in that spot i think maybe he put some of those uh some of those doubters to rest with his performance uh in that one drive uh on thursday night so i didn't see if he came out and did anything more after that but uh five for five for like 70 yards and a touchdown he was just out there running the offense like it was made specifically for him uh, he was out there with a lot of the starters, not all of them, but he was. There was a lot of starters he was still going up against, so it was good competition that he was uh, going up against. So we'll see. We get to see him. Maybe Saquon. He didn't play at all in that first game against the Jets. Maybe Saquon will play uh, and and everything else. So Friday night, the Bears and Giants. That's going to be the next one. That'll be the next time that I come back. So a week from today on Saturday. We'll do another episode a week. We'll do a preseason review for week number two uh, next week. So um, hit me up on social media at BTU underscore Larry on Twitter uh, at BTU underscore Larry on Instagram. I got to admit, I'm not a big Instagram guy, but it's out there. So, you know, I don't post regularly on Instagram, just show announcements and 
things like that. But, uh, you know, if you got questions or whatever, uh, send, me, send me questions on Twitter, send me questions on Instagram, Facebook, the Bearstock Underground uh, page, and everything. So there you have it. Hit me up. Let's talk. Bears and Giants next Friday. So we'll see you next Saturday to review preseason week number two, the Bears and Giants. Until then, my name is Larry D, and this has been the Bears Talk Underground.